Uh, so th the problem I want to look at, if I can see how to advance the slide, ah, bottom, is a uh, following sort of generic problem, at least in scientific uh, computation. We have data about some unknown function, some function f unknown to us. We have some data, and we want to answer some question about f. This is a typical setting. And uh, you can think of whatever examples you like. I hope some of them are uh, of interest to you. And there are two types of questions we can uh, formulate. One is uh, what we'd like to do is to predict the values of f at other points or other variables. I call that the full approximation problem, because I don't know what point you're going to ask me for the value of f at, so I have to approximate f everywhere. The second problem is there is some quantity of interest, some narrower quantity that I, I'm interested in about f. So why we segregate these two problems? Because the second one should be easier, right? Because we don't have to know f everywhere. Perhaps we can do a better job be more accurate with fewer computations. Now, I'm a mathematician, so uh, my interest is uh, centered around two things. I want algorithms to solve these problems, but I want very much that the al algorithms are optimal and certifiable. Optimal means I'm worried that uh, next week you're going to come up and say, hey, I got a better algorithm than yours, and I'm totally embarrassed that I didn't think of this. Certifiable means that if you ask me for the accuracy of the algorithm, I can tell you this before you even begin the computation. So mathematicians worry about these things. That's why we don't sleep at night. Uh, so that'll be one of the main, main uh, points of this talk. So uh, let's, I want to start with the problem of full approximation. I'll later, when I come near the end of the last 10 or 15 minutes, talk about uh, some, some uh, quantity that I want to compute. So uh, if you want to formulate this problem mathematically, you have to uh, spell out the setting in some way. And uh, here are the main features. First, the form of the data. Sorry that I keep flipping this. I think it's the pointer. So uh, the, the form of the data, that is, what, do, what, am I, what information am I given about this function f? And I assume that this is in the form of what we mathematicians call linear functional flight f, such as a point value or an integral or something of that sort. The second thing we have to uh, decide upon is how we're going to, or third thing mentioned here, is how to measure performance. Because uh, if two of us are going to fight about who has the best algorithm, we should be agreeing on how we're measuring what best means. So we have some metric in which we're measuring distortion. So by this norm or metric, uh, this is how I'm going to, you're going to create an approximation to f from the data. I'm going to create one. We're going to check which one is closer in this, this norm here. OK, and the information we have about f is these measurements, which are numbers, right? I mean, I apply these linear functionals, I get a number. I get that the Fourier coefficient, the fourth Fourier coefficient is this, or whatever the information I have. OK, and then an algorithm, what is that? It's a mapping that takes this data, the numbers, and maps it into a function. And I measure the performance of the algorithm on a given f by how far does the approximation it creates from the data differ from f. So that's the measure of performance on one f. Now, if you start to think about this problem, if, if this problem is formulated for you and you, you think for 10 minutes, you come up and say, I, I can't say anything about the performance of an algorithm. Because f could be anything. So you have to give me some more information about f. This is the hardest part, by the way, for mathematicians when they're consulting with engineers or, or some, is to extract from the engineer. He, he doesn't want to tell you what he knows about f. 
But this is, of course, the, the key in construction of algorithms. So we need to know more about the function f, this, I'll call it a target function that we're trying to approximate. And the information you give me about f, we, we put into what we call a model class. So I'm in a deterministic setting here. You're perhaps familiar with the stochastic setting, which is more closely in line with st statistical learning. But uh, this uh, model class is what I know about f. And the typical deterministic model classes are built on some knowledge about f having some smoothness. Maybe f came from some solution to some differential equation, so you can prove that it's smooth in some sense. Or maybe it's a signal and you know something about a spectral content that is band limited or some other information. Or perhaps better for this community is in high dimensional problems, we have to wrestle with what are the correct model classes. This is not at all clear. And notions such as sparsity, anisotropy, variable reduction, feature extraction, all this is wrapped up in this notion of what is the model class, what do you know about the function f you're trying to approximate. So let's suppose now that we have a model class. This will be key to us that we have a good model class, but we have to work with whatever we have. So we have a model class k. So k denotes the model class, what I know about f. And, uh, and I, whoops, I said uh, several of these points already, how important model classes are. Oh, here's a, a point maybe interesting. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, deep learning, neural networks, and that. What, to, from a point of view of somebody in approximation theory, analysis, numerical analysis, our view is that in neural networks and, and deep learning, there are advantages that they apply to a, a wide universal collection of model classes. They're very weak assumption on the function f because it can be sparse in many different types of representations and it still is captured in this deep learning setup. Okay, so model classes we'll come back to as we proceed. So here's our problem. We have this model class. We fix the metric and we're going to measure the error in and we make these measurements. So what do we really know about f? We know that f is in this set of all functions in our model class to satisfy the measurements. So I can really tell you the best algorithm for recovering f because this is all I know about f. What I look, do is I look at this set kw. In fact, I'll do it on a graphic here in this next slide. So what I know about f is it's in this pink set kw, right? It's in k, satisfies the measurements w, that's what I know about it. So it could be any point in, k, in this pink region. So the best I can do to approximate is to take the center of the smallest ball that contains kw. It's called the Chebyshev ball. And the best error I can give for approximating f is the radius of this ball. I take the center as the approximation, and the radius will be the error that I'll, I'll, I'll have. And that's an a priori estimate for the error. Now, the same thing is going to happen for a quantity of interest. Now you look at all guys in kw, you look at the range of the quantity of interest, and again, you take the smallest ball that contains this quantity of interest. If the quantity of interest is a real number, like you're interested in the integral or the maximum of a function, then this set in blue will be an interval, and you want the center of the interval. Okay, it sounds very easy that, wow, here's this guy, isn't it wonderful? He solved all the problems. Well, not quite, Don't, not so fast. Because it's very hard to find this Chebyshev ball. You give me the set K, I, my job, I have to find the, the center of this ball. And what is the Chebyshev ball? What's its radius? Very hard. So this is not done in many contexts. Where many, in fact, if you 
probably a model class you may be interested in. I may not be able to describe this uh, Chebyshev ball, and I may not be able to describe the center, and therefore a best algorithm. So my advertisement here is a, another approach, and that is the, motivated by the following reasoning. If you're going to create an algorithm to approximate your function f, about which you have the data, f is unknown to you, you're going to use some form of approximation. Maybe neural networks, maybe splines, maybe wavelets, maybe uh, sparse representation, dictionary learning. Whatever you're going to use, you're sort of specifying a method of approximation. So I, and what you really think when you say this is the one I'm going to use is you believe your function f can be approximated well by this method. Otherwise, why are you using it, right? So you've picked some numerical method v, or, or, or a vehicle to do approximation, which I'll call v. Okay, that's the guys I'm going to use to do the approximation. Maybe it's polynomials, right, of degree 8. You think that's what you should use for, for the creation of your algorithm. And you think your function is well approximated by polynomials of degree 8. Otherwise, why did you uh, use them? So I propose as an approximation set all functions which are approximated by your v, the one that you chose, to some accuracy epsilon. I don't care what epsilon is. What I'm going to talk about will work for every epsilon and is independent of epsilon. So I call this model class an approximation set. And I think this is, uh, to me, the right setting for describing model classes. And now, given that, I'm going to now tell you the optimal algorithm and how it performs. Okay, so that's the good news. That if you tell me what V is, I'll tell you what the optimal algorithm is, and I'll tell you how it performs. So a key in all this, in description of how it performs, is a certain number mu written here. So mu is something you're going to have to learn to love and live with. Mu is, is, is looking at the following. So we have what we call the null space of this measurement map. That's all functions whose data is zero. Now think, if you have a function f and you have its measurements, if you add something from the null space to f, it doesn't change the measurements, right? It's going to have the same measurements. So the null space has to be important. And the question is, adding something from the null space when do you spill out of k? When do you spill out of your, your, your set? And you'll do that if the distance is big. So this number here measures how big can the norm be given a control for, uh, on the distance. So this number mu is going to be very important. And now what is the, the uh, uh, answer to our, our question? First of all, the best performance we can give for any algorithm, completely determined, in the case that x is a Hilbert space, that the norm is like a least squares norm, then the best performance is mu times epsilon. So think about this a minute. Epsilon s natural, because we, we thought of f as being approximable by v to accuracy epsilon. So our dream is that we would recover in an algorithm, we would recover f to accuracy epsilon, right? Because that's what we we're assuming about f that it can be approximated by uh, v to accuracy epsilon. But we're losing something. We don't get epsilon, we get mu times epsilon. Why mu? Because we don't have full knowledge of f. We only have the data. And the data could be bad. The data is not telling us all about f. This is the punishment of the data, the mu. So mu is sort of telling you, do you have good data or do you have bad data? If mu is 5, the data is pretty good. We can't complain too much. If mu is 1,000, we have a problem. You're not giving me good enough data to recover f. This holds, this Hilbert space, we have equality for other norms or other metrics. Same thing holds, but we have a little loss. This factor 2, we're squashed between mu epsilon and 2 mu epsilon. It has to do with the geometry of unit balls in these spaces. Don't concern yourself with that. Basically, we have solved the, uh, 
the problem of the accuracy. Now, what is the algorithm? I haven't told you the algorithm yet. So let me describe the algorithm in the case of the Hilbert space, and you'll all know the algorithm. So what is the algorithm in the case of the Hilbert space? I get my data, W, and I look at all V in the, in the space V that I'm agreed upon that does a good job of approximating F, and I try to find a V such that the measurements of V match the given measurements. That's least squares. That's what you do in least squares, right? First thing you do in data fitting in any class, you do least squares. That's all I'm doing is least squares. I'm doing least squares from the set V that you told me is a, is a good model for, for my app, okay? Actually, the best algorithm is a slight adjustment of least squares. I don't want to dwell on that. The mu, usually when you, you know, and I started looking through textbooks about least squares, and does mu appear? And I never see mu in these te textbooks. I never see a performance estimate for least squares. What I gave you on the previous slide here is a performance estimate that I never see. And I never see the mu. But mu can be easily calculated. By the way, I want to stress that in all the examples that I'm talking about, mu is easy to calculate. You can calculate it. It's not some uh, nebulous quantity that you can't put your hands on. So, what is new about the, this little discussion I made is that you generally don't see mu and that I'm giving you a a priori analysis for the performance, in this case least squares, but it could be in any metric you wanted, <clears throat> okay? And you can see now, since you can compute mu, you can get an idea whether you have good data or you have, don't have good data. All right, here's a cartoon image that tells you what's going on here in, the, in, in this Hilbert space case. So what I, I have this space V, this is your, you say that F is well approximated by V, and the cylinder is a cylinder with radius epsilon, because I know that F can be approximated by V to accuracy epsilon, so it's in this green cylinder. I have the measurements W, that's this, all functions that have measurements W is this red line, but I only get the segment that's in the cylinder because I have the two things. I, I know that F has measurements W and I, I know that its accuracy and approximation by V is, is epsilon. So what I know about F is it's on this line and the best, of course, the best approximation is the center of that line segment, okay? And now what is this mu? Well, think now that this space V starts tilting up towards the null space. It's closer and closer to the null space. This cylinder starts moving. This red line will have bigger and bigger length, right? As V, v flips up. And that's what corresponds to bad data, and that's what, what the role of mu is. Okay. Uh, I want to stress a little bit the choice of V because you know, if you're thinking, let's say you're thinking about least squares, you have data and you, you're going to use least squares. You could use polynomials of degree 5, 10, 13, what, what should you do? Okay, and this is a discussion that tries to answer that, that point. So, uh, but I'm going to do the, the discussion with a different, uh, slightly different problem. Uh, with a different uh, metric. Namely, I'm going to say, okay, suppose our situation is the, the information we have about F are point values, and we want to approximate F in a uniform sense, maximum of the distance between the two functions. Okay? Then what is mu? You pick the space V, and mu, again, is something you can easily compute. It's the, the worst set, as you look over this class V, think of V as being polynomials of degree seven. And you have the true norm, of max norm of the polynomial, and this discrete norm. And this max norm will be always bigger than this discrete norm, and how much bigger it can be, that's mu, okay? So, it, it can, for example, consider the case where we had polynomials on an interval and the data was equally spaced. And we want to do polynomial data, uh, fitting in some sense. 
What should we do? What degree should we pick up for the polynomials? What should n be? We have m data points. What should n be? If you choose n equal to m, that is, you use all the, you say, I'll, I'll choose the degree of the polynomial the same as the number of measurements, then all you're going to do is interpolate. You're going to fit exactly all the data. The good news is the error is going to be very good in, in some, at least at the data points, it's going to be very good. The bad news is that mu is horrible. Anybody that knows interpolation theory knows that interpolation by polynomials, the Lebesgue constant grows like exponentially. So in fact, the mu in that case will be like a to the n. If you use instead a more modest value for n, for example, square root of m, m is the number of data points, then you can prove that mu is bounded. And you still have quite a bit of accuracy, right, in the polynomial approximation. So what does this tell you? It says to you, if you have a real problem, what you should do is first understand what is mu and what is the trade-off between the accuracy epsilon you gain from taking this space V of higher and higher complexity versus the growth in this mu, which is going to grow bad, what is the trade-off? And that'll be part of the game. And the bottom line is, don't take n so large. Don't overfit. This is, of course, a principle you know from statistical learning, right? Don't overfit the data, don't, right? For other reasons. Let me say a few words on high dimension because I kind of, you know, the examples I gave were like the last one, you say, well, who's interested in approximating a function on, on zero, one? But it, it, suppose you want to do high dimension. How does this theory come out, and what, what, is, uh, what can we be saying about this? The, the main uh, issue is what are the, the good model classes in high dimension, or what should you use for v, right? What, how should you approximate a function of a lot of variables? Okay, and there are a lot of ideas around sparsity, right? Uh, as we already mentioned, neural networks, sparse grids, this, that. There, people trying to break what we call the curse of dimensionality. That generally speaking, to approximate a function of many variables is very difficult. We better have some <coughs> properties of this function other than just smoothness. The properties we, we, we think maybe govern the, the, the real world are that some variables are more important than other variables. They're not all equally democratic and equally important. So we have the idea of anisotropy or model reduction. If you can reduce this model. So that's a key issue. Once you have the model class, I claim that what I just told you all goes through. And this is, you can do everything uh, just the same. You can compute the mu and, and, and so forth, and you can describe certifiable algorithms. But there is a bottleneck. What is the bottleneck? What uh, the speaker before me was talking about, the computational bottleneck to actually execute the algorithm can be very computationally intensive, may take you days to, to actually find the best algorithm, right? Maybe months and years. In PDEs, we actually do something in model reduction, what we call it offline. It makes it a lot easier to, to digest. Offline, we can do it, we can take five months and do it offline, but then we have the algorithm and we're happy and we said, well, we're done. We have the algorithm now, but we're willing to spend a lot of time offline. Okay. I, I haven't talked about quantities of interest. Now I want to talk about quantities of interest. I mentioned to you these should be easier problems than, than the full approximation problem. What happens to, in the theory briefly go over the theory. The same theory holds almost verbatim as what happened in full approximation. For example, you get estimates of this for performance of best algorithms. You have epsilon, which is again is how well you can approximate f by your model class v or your set of approximants v. Uh, the new thing is that you have a different mu. This mu is smaller than the other mu. It's smaller because you have this quantity of interest rather than full approximation. What is mu is the ratio, in this case, before, remember, with the norm of eta. 
Now I only have how big is Q of eta? Well, Q of eta is always controlled by the norm of eta, but it could be a lot smaller, right? Could be something that is a lot smaller and a lot uh, more local. So mu, generally speaking here, for a quantity of interest is smaller and therefore will get better performance uh, here. I want to, how would we find an optimal algorithm? So let's say you have a quantity of interest. You know the metric that, you know, you, that F can be approximated well in. You know V. How would you find, how would you find an optimal algorithm? You can always find it. It's a minimization problem. What you do is you look at, you're trying to uh, uh, approximate Q of F. What you look at is all linear functionals that can be written in terms of your data. These are your data functionals, LJ. These are the measurements you made, the functionals you use to make measurements. For example, the points where you evaluated after the integrals or the Fourier coefficients or whatever you have. Okay, those are the LJ. So these are, are your known data functionals. And you look at all linear combinations and you say, okay, these are the guys I'll try to use to create my algorithm. And I'll look at all those that agree with Q on the space V that uh, we think is a good space for F. So we look only at the linear algorithm or, or the linear functionals that agree with Q. And we try to find the one that is closest to Q on the whole space. So this is a minimization, this is a constrained minimization. When we solve it, we get these numbers, AJ star. The good news is that our final approximation to Q of F is given by a linear map. Simply, we just take the data and we map it into this. It's just an inner product of these coefficients with the data. So if we have to do this task 100 times or a million times, it's very fast. Because we find once and for all the AJ star we find the optimal algorithm. And we know this is optimal. It's the best performance. I just want to emphasize one thing. Before I had the performance measured in terms of mu, I want to write the performance. This is a little less uh, accurate a measurement of performance, but it shows something. Namely, you can prove that uh, this performance is less than the distance between Q and L star, right? This approximation times the distance. And now you see that if, for example, Q was one of the LJs, I mean, of course, you're not going to be so lucky, right, that the quantity of interest you want is given to you in the measurement. But if it were, you'd get zero, right, as you should. And the closer it is to a linear combination of the measurements, the better this will be. Okay. Uh, I, I want to take one example in quadrature and, and expand on this a little bit. So quadrature, you know, you may say, oh, my God, quadrature, I heard about that in the 1980s or something. What did they, you know, well, it didn't sound interesting then. Why is it interesting now? <laughs> Actually, quadrature is used a lot on high dimensional problems, Monte Carlo uh, type methods, uh, uh, stock options, uh, parametric PDEs, uh, high dimensional integration is a substantial uh, problem. And what I'm going to tell you about works doesn't matter what the dimension is. So what's my problem in, in, in quadrature? I have a function f. The measurements I have are values of f at some points. And I want to compute a quantity of interest, which is some integral of f, or maybe an integral times the weight. What does this theory tell me to do? This theory tells me, I'll, I'll tell you the best algorithm given this model class V. It all depends on V, you know, different V, different solution to this. But if you think you have the right V, I'll tell you the solution. The solution is to look at all formulas that would numerically integrate the guys in your class V and find a one with these coefficients, AJ, to have the smallest little l1 norm. Well, this is a constrained little l1 minimization, somewhat costly to implement, not too cheap, but can be done. Well, once you're done, you have once and for all the optimal solution. If you have to do this many times, that is, you're going to see many times uh, 
samples of a function at these prescribed points. It tells you what to do, and, you, and it does the computation. This happens a lot in optimization problems. It also tells you the performance. It tells you the performance, and this is the best you can do. And this mu you can compute. What is mu is the sum of the absolute values of these AJ stars. So how big did this become when I solved this optimization problem? So it's something I can concretely put my, my hands on. OK, I thought I'd do a, a little example. Maybe it will bring home how, how this all plays out in, in, in practice. Of course, there are a zillion examples I could give, but I chose this one. Uh, that of predicting the, the global temperature, because you read and they say, oh, global temperatures have gone up in the last years, and I wonder, well, how do they, what do they compute? How do they know this? So uh, what is the data? The data is that we have sites around the world where we're measuring temperature. These are denoted in blue, and you should notice that these sites are concentrated in the United States, and in Europe. And if you're a guy like me, if you're a skeptic, uh, immediately you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm afraid this muse could be, could be very bad, right? Because I have this, looks to me like I have lousy data. You know, if you're talking about global temperature, you want to tell me, you don't have enough information down here to tell me what the temperature is. Seems to me, okay? So I take a skeptical view. All right? So, you wonder, is the mu going to be bad for this data set or not? What's going to happen, all right? So let's dig into this a little bit. Uh, what, what would we like? What would I like if somebody presented to me and said, OK, do an analysis of this. Are we doing the right thing? Or, or do we have the right algorithms? How do we perform? I would like them to tell me, first of all, what's the right model class for this temperature? So real, go, let's go back a, a minute. The temperature, the quantity we're trying to compute is the integral over the whole Earth. X varies over position on the Earth. And over time, let's say in a given year, right, 1997. All right, that's what we're, we're attempting to, to compute. So what's critical is how nice is this function? Can you tell me something about that function? It would be nice if you could tell me from physical principles or something, uh, this is a smooth function, or this, this function has this property, that property, and therefore you know it's nice, and you should be able to approximate it well by polynomials or splines or, or rational functions or something, right? That's what I'd like to know. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have such uh, great information uh, and to get, extract this uh, information, we'd really have to dig into the physics and go back to the constituency equations for uh, you know, temperature distribution and, and, and all that. And, and I, I don't think that's uh, realistic at this stage. OK, another problem is I would like that you're measuring the, the temperature at the same position on the Earth every year and at the same time during the day or whatever. Not that uh, you measure it at this place this year and the next year you measure somewhere else. This is disturbing to me that you're changing the sites. But in actuality, they do change the sites. In actuality, if you look at the sites that they determine the data at one year and look at the next year, they're different. Right? That, that's a disturbing fact, but we have to deal with what, you know, you have to deal with what you have, right? You can't change the problem. OK, what do the current algorithms do? I claim that they're based somehow on piecewise polynomials as V. They're trying to take V. Remember, V is the set of functions we use to approximate T and freeze little t, freeze the time, little t. They're, as a function of x, they're trying to use uh, piecewise polynomials or spline functions or piecewise linear uh, on, on, on the surface of the Earth. Something, something like this. We'll get into this where uh, what, what uh, the problem is. I think, I, yeah, I have here a schematic that this is how what I extract at reading uh, these papers on how they determine uh, global temperature, uh, what they're doing. So 
Let me go through this quickly, would you? Okay, they make some temperature measurements at different uh, locations. The next step, what they do is they look at this data and say, hey, this one doesn't look right. This, this, this can't be the temperature there. I'm in Alaska and it says 100 degrees. This isn't right. So they throw, start throwing out stuff. So it's hard for me to analyze you know, what they're doing here, but uh, they, they, do, they call this outlier removal and quality control. What is the next thing they do? They, they, they talk about urban adjustment. So urban adjustment, well, they may say, uh, you know, buildings warm, you know, they hold heat and then they release heat at night if you measure it and it's not the real temperature at night, it's that, this or that. Or they may say, I'm on, a, on the coast and sea breeze comes in and lowers my reading when it's really warmer than it is. So they make these kind of adjustments. You know, can you mathematically, precisely describe these adjustments? No, I mean, you can't. I mean, there's some human in the loop is making these adjustments, which uh, concerns me. But the main step that they make right here is the key. After they've done this the massaging of the data, they generate on the sphere, they do a gridding of the sphere, a uniform gridding of the sphere, and try to describe at every one of those grid points a temperature. Of course, they don't have a measurement at that grid point, but they use the nearby uh, temperature readings to predict the measurement at this grid point. This is uh, the fuzzy part where mathematically I can't put my hands on exactly what they're doing. They may they sometimes use nearest neighbors and this and that, sometimes they use something else, but this all makes it uh, difficult to, to, to nail down mathematically. And then they uh, sometimes enter new data because they see that, oh, they were missing a lot, a lot of regions at this grid point where they want to compute. They don't have data nearby, so they go to a second source of satellite data or sea, sea surface temperatures, and they insert there. So this is what they do. They end up with some uh, and then they, then they do some numerical integration based on piecewise polynomials, and that's what they say is the global temperature. Now, is this the global temperature? I, I, I don't know what this is, but I, I don't think you can say this is the global temperature, but it's something, it's indicating global temperature. Now, what we did is a little tighter, because what we said is, first of all, we'll, only, we won't, we'll use the first massaging of the data, but we won't use the gridding. That step where they go from this data readings to gridding is a very nebulous step to me. I don't understand, so I don't want to use that step. We'll start from, uh, we'll start from here after they've done this adjustment. This is their adjusted data. But I won't use this arm. I won't take what they've done here, because I don't trust this. And uh, what we do is we use spherical harmonics. Well, what's the advantage of spherical? I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I'm saying my temperature function is well approximated. I'm assuming it's well approximated by spherical harmonics of a certain degree. And that's what I'll use to build my optimal algorithm. So I can build the optimal algorithm then. So I build the op optimal algorithm, and just as a comparison, because I was somewhat surprised, the red curve is their curve. This is NASA Goddard. The blue curve is our curve based on spherical harmonics. They don't differ too much. Ours is a little lower, but I mean, this is not a significant uh, difference. And this is, that, that was spherical harmonics of degree six, and this is spherical harmonics of degree nine. Now you believe that as you increase the degree of the spherical harmonics, you're approximating T, right? This temperature better and better because you, you have more flexibility in the approximation. But what you have to worry about is this mu, right? Remember mu, don't forget it. Mu is telling you how trustworthy is this data. And now I show you uh, uh, something about the growth of mu. So as you increase the degree of the spherical harmonics, the mu starts increasing. And if we, why we stop here, six and nine, is if we went to 12, mu would suddenly be 24. So if, if our accuracy, you know, if we have a plot and we have something and it's, if we had 0.2 degrees accuracy in terms of uh, the approximation power, 
it would be 24 times 0.2, which is 4.8, way off in terms of the prediction of the actual temperature. So we stop here because this tells us, hey, you've got a problem with your data. You can't choose mu too high. Now, I would love to be able to put down their mu, what they do for their piecewise polynomials. Unfortunately, it's too uh, complicated to understand exactly uh, what, what uh, what, which piecewise polynomials they're using. They're using piecewise polynomials, but they have some constraints on them because they only allow the, the gridded data to be generated in a certain way through nearest neighbors and, and the like. But let's, uh, let's drop that. Okay, so uh, I want to now uh, summarize a little bit what I was hoping to tell you. I, look, you know, the organizers were very uh, smart to save the last two speakers to be mathematically inclined. So the pain, right, is at the end, you can go home and you can relax and say, oh, God, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a mathematician. Jeez, oh, God. So, but anyway, here's what I was trying to tell you. I tell you some ideas about data assimilation. That first of all, if you can tell me the model class, that is, what is K and what is the good V, you're in great shape. I can tell you what to do in an optimal sense. You tell me the metric you want to measure error in, I can tell you optimal algorithm. That's good news. Uh, the second part is this, this mu. Uh, we have the certified performance, but the certified performance involves this mu. So I hope that this mu is something new to you, that you say, hey, you know, I should be careful when I have this data, I'm computing something, can I guarantee that what I'm computing is accurate to what I want to compute? Well, you have to deal with this mu. And this is something you can compute, so it's actually useful when you're given data to compute this mu so that you can see at least some benchmark for how accurate you can be. Now, what is a, what is a challenge in the future? I think we're all interested in high dimensional problems where the function, underlying function we're trying to capture depends on a lot of variables, parameters, features, what, whatever. The challenge is to quantify the correct model classes. For example, if you believe deep learning, neural net, this is it, well tell me what functions those guys approximate well. What are the functions? Now there are some theorems out there that says, oh, if the function can be approximated by a sparse wavelet uh, decomposition, the neural net will do it, or ridgelets, or this or that. But this doesn't characterize the functions that can be approximated well. Typically in approximation theory, we have if and only if statements. This can be approximated well if and only if the function has this property. This is what we need for uh, deep learning. Uh, Another issue in high dimensions is the feasibility of computation. I didn't, you know, I didn't emphasize how many machine operations does it take me to compute this optimal algorithm. You know, I sort of slid that under the rug. And uh, this could be an issue. And especially when you move to high dimensions, this is an issue. So you may want to bypass an optimal algorithm for a pretty good algorithm if you can implement it uh, numerically. Okay. Uh, Understand. I close on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Uh, questions? Is there any question from the audience? Oh, there is one over there. Okay. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, so uh, there is one more thing that uh, we have to solve an L2 minimization. Right, with neural networks, that's a non-convex one. So even if we know the mu, let's say, we don't know if we can solve that optimization. Yeah, that's a so computational maybe. issue. I, as I said right at the end, I didn't address the uh, computational issues that arise, and uh, especially in neural networks, which is very complicated with, I mean, the advantage is that you have all these possibilities. We think of it like a dictionary, a huge dictionary, and you're trying to find a sparse representation from this huge dictionary. Combinatorially, this is a huge problem, right? Because you have uh, capital N is the number of uh, neurons, and, and little n is the number you're going to end up with as your sparse. As capital N 
taking a little land at a possibility. So how can you, how can you do this? What we do in mathematics is we have what we call greedy algorithms. We have an algorithm that uh, can be performed uh, numerically, and then we try to prove that this performs nearly as good as if you did the complete optimization. But you're giving up something. And that has to be analyzed and, and, and given set. Thank you. I, I have another question, so. So how you have to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's free? <laughs> this is right. It's a private institution. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so in the mu, uh, so uh, like this uh, uh, dependence on the null space, do you yeah. think there is a connection between like, uh, or, you know, the uh, compressed sensing kind of restricted oh, isometry? Oh yeah, exactly. Property? This is the restricted isometry property. This is what in compressed sensing we call the null space property. And to guarantee that mu is small, you impose RIP, restricted isometry. What you should notice here is I didn't allow you to pick the measurements. You want to go there and say, ah, I'll pick these best measurements, these random guys. I don't allow you that. I'm stuck with whatever measurements you give me. You have a current MRI machine to give you certain measurements. I don't allow you to rebuild the MRI machine. You must use the measurements you have. This says that there'll be a mu associated with your given measurement. You cannot drive down mu by saying, oh, I'll give up your measurements and measure somewhere else. That's another problem. Galfond with best sensor. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I think there's been a been a long day. So let's uh, thank uh, Ron again. You know. <laughs>